I was a bit worried what I would say at the start of my talk, but Erin has done the job for me because I come from computational mechanics background. I came to know about Jim Wilkinson only a year and a half ago. And my parents met each other four years after Jim died. So I, I, I might be a bit out of place, but whatever I have heard about Jim from Sven, I'm really humbled and honored to be here. And thanks to Nick, Sven, and Fran for giving me this opportunity. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about a bit uh, a specific problem. Uh, if we are using half precision, Jack has already said quite a bit about half precision. Uh, so half precision is increasingly available in many computer hardware. So there are two types of half precision basically here. So one is Bfloat 16, another one is FP16. So FP16, the difference between them is FP16 has five bits in the exponent and ten bits in the mantissa. Bfloat 16 has 8 bits in the exponents and 7 bits in the mantissa. So Bfloat 16 has the same number of bits in the exponent as single precision. So that's why you could see the range of numbers which you can represent in Bfloat 16 is quite big. So FP16, I'm, I'm completely interested in FP16 in this talk. It's already available in many hardware, especially in GPUs. So all the NVIDIA GPUs since P100 support FP16 format and AMD uh, GPUs as well. And with respect to future machines, uh, the ARM processor, the Fujitsu ARM processor, which is supposed to power the exascale machine of Japan, will support FP16 and even the IBM chip as well. Uh, but with respect to Bfloat 16, it's only Google TPUs as of now which support them. Uh, but the future Intel chips are supposed to support them, but uh, that's what we know. Okay. Uh, <coughs> even though the main driver for all these architectural advancements are machine learning, uh, but there is a great interest and a great deal of effort being put into using these new kinds of architectures for general purpose scientific computing. Uh, for example, Tim Palmer's group at Oxford, they're exploring the idea of using these low precision data formats for climate modeling, and, and they have huge amount of success. So far. Uh, but I'm quite interested in numerical linear algebra. So how can we use these, how, these new data formats in our usual numerical linear algebra computations itself. So I'm going to be talking about solving linear system of equations, and specifically the algorithm designed by Nick and Erin, the GMRES based iterative refinement. <coughs> so the basic idea of GMRES based iterative refinement is you compute the initial LU factors of your given matrix in half precision, compute the initial approximation of the solution using those half precision LU factors, and then use them as preconditioners and refine your solution using GMRES. Okay, so basically you are using multiple precisions here. So the precision in which your matrix is given and the lower precision in which you compute your LU factors as well. So this whole idea of using multi-precision or the multi-precision algorithms form a part of a much larger picture actually. So where we are, where one would be using some unconventional methods to obtain huge amount of speed ups, but at the same point of time, without compromising anything on the accuracy or stability of the algorithms. So Jack and his group in a paper, they very nicely place it in a group called responsibly reckless algorithms. And in this talk, I'm mostly focusing on GMRS IR itself. And what are the specific issues which we need to address before we can successfully use it for general purpose computing. OK, so what are the features of, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the features of GMRES IR is that, uh, unlike the usual iterative refinement, it will guarantee you a small forward and backward error un until this particular condition is satisfied. So here, A tilde is the condition number of the preconditioned matrix, unlike, the uh, unlike in the usual iterative refinement where it is the condition number of the matrix itself. So that's one really important point. And the second point is that Jack and his group have demonstrated in a number of publications that if you use state-of-the-art hardware devices like NVIDIA V100, you can obtain up to four times speed up compared to LAPAC implementation, and you can have up to 80% savings in the energy. And moreover, the implementation of this algorithm is already available in uh, open source software such as Magma, which comes out of Jack's group. So, uh, so far so good. What's the catch? So the catch is this. So the, the range of numbers which you can ap actually represent in half precision is quite small. So this 10 power minus 8 is the subnormal number. So it ranges from 10 power minus 8 to around 65,500. 
So anything beyond 65,500 is infinity, and less than 10 power minus 8 is 0. Okay? So, most of, uh, so many of us who have worked in uh, application side, we know that we always end up with numbers which are much, much larger than this or smaller than this. So the problem is, if you convert a given matrix into half precision, three things can happen. So the entries could underflow, the entries could overflow, or the some numbers can be bumped in to the uh, subnormal range. So if the subnormal numbers are handled in software, then you can have performance penalties as well. So the requirement is this. We need an algorithm which could squeeze or rather fit the matrix into the narrow range of half precision, but at the same point of time, it makes the full use of whatever narrow range you have. So what I exactly mean by whilst using its complete range, it will become clear as I go along. Okay, so there are some really straightforward, simple remedies which we can adopt. So you are given a matrix in half precision, uh, you are given a matrix, convert it into half precision, you encounter a bunch of infinities here and there, just replace it with the maximum number in the half precision. That is what I call as x max here. So that theta there, theta is a number between 0 and 1, which gives you some headroom for further computation. So if this is x max, you just uh, push it down little below x max, so theta into x max. So that's why you could turn a non-singular matrix into a singular one, right? Yes, yes, sure. So th that's one of the uh, problems as well. So you can make it singular or you can do a large perturbation to the matrix as well. So can, you, can you tell us, do these low precision formats have IEEE style infinity as an option or not? Yes, it does. But you it don't use that in No, no. So, <coughs> and the second one which you can do is, take the largest element of your matrix, divide the whole matrix by that small number, uh, by that large number. <laughs> so essentially you have all your entries between minus one and one now. So you're essentially squeezing all of the entries between minus one and one. Now expand the range and multiply it by x max. So you have all the entries between minus x max to plus x max. Again, theta does the same role of giving some headroom for further computation. So the problem is, uh, if, you if the difference between the smallest and the largest elements is very large, then again you can end up with very small numbers and it can underflow and making the matrix singular. Okay, so we have these two simple remedies and there are some really obvious problems with them. So what else can we do? So what we can do is that scale the rows and the columns separately or essentially do a two-sided diagonal scaling. So I'm, I'm not saying we need to use any specific kind of diagonal scaling because there is a zillion type of diagonal scalings which you can actually use. Any sort of diagonal scaling might do, okay? So do the diagonal scaling of the matrix and usually now again all your entries will be between minus one and one. Okay, do diagonal scaling and bring all the entries between minus one and one and then uh, increase the range of numbers between again x max and minus x max, that is the maximum range. Okay, so one thing uh, to consider a specific example here, I'm going to consider the row and column equilibration here which is implemented in LAPAC by the way. So basically what we do is that find the row norm, uh, find, uh, find the row norm of the row infinity norm of the uh, matrix, then multiply it and then find the column infinity norm and multiply it. Do you do that in witness for certain No. So first I need to bring all the elements within the range of FP16 and then convert it into half precision. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but there are certain catches here. So now we have, an, we have a couple of algorithms which we can use to convert a matrix <coughs> into half precision, but there is one point which is not yet clear. That is, how would I choose theta? So as I mentioned, the, the design requirement for the choice of theta is that the, I need to have sufficient headroom to do further computation. So <coughs> because I'm, like I mentioned, I'm interested in GM reciterative refinement where I'm using half precision LU factors as preconditioners, I'm going to talk just about LU factorization itself. So all the elements of the lower triangular matrix are less than one, so I don't have a problem. But when it comes to the upper triangular matrix, it is bounded by the growth factor times the maximum element. So the choice of theta is dictated by the growth factor. So a uh, growth factor of 10 is more or less unlikely, so a theta factor of 0.1 would be sufficient. So that's one thing. 
But there is one subtle point which we need to address is the underflow of pivots in when you are doing your LU factorization in half precision. So we can show that. Oh, okay. So we can show that if the condition number of the matrix is greater than that there, that particular value on that side of the inequality, then there is no problem of underflow of pivots and everything is fine. And for half precision, this value is one is of the order of 10 power 11. So because we are doing diagonal scaling and then doing LU factorization of that. So diagonal scaling usually reduces the condition number. So in all our numerical experiments, we observed that the condition number is far lesser than that. So underflow of pivots was never a problem. So just look at quickly look at few numerical experiments. So we consider uh, there were 31 matrices. OK, we considered matrices with entries greater than the maximum of half precision and of size less than 300. Why 300? I'll I'll let you know why. And among there were 31 such matrices in sweet sparse matrix collection, <coughs> and 13 representative of all the 30 of them we chose. So in the GM reciterative refinement, we considered two combinations of precision, that is uh, half precision for factorization, single precision is the precision in which your matrix is given, and double precision is the precision in which the residuals are computed. Okay? Similarly, half, double, and quadruple <coughs> precision as well. So for our FP16 computation, uh, I used the uh, FP16 class by Cleave. And for quad precision, I used Advanced PICS toolbox. I had to choose 300 as the size because the FP16 class would be very slow for LU factorization beyond 300. So <coughs> but there is another subtle point. So because we are doing diagonal scaling, even though it would reduce the condition number, if we work with the diagonally scaled matrix, then we are playing around with the norms. Okay, so it we should always like we we would prefer to work with unscaled norm itself. So even though we perform diagonal scaling and do LU factorization in half precision, we bring bring them back here. Okay, we are essentially again working with unscaled problem itself. So and the iterative refinement is terminated when the backward error reaches that particular criterion, the last red one. Okay, results. <coughs> Uh, so inf represents like uh, putting uh, like if you have a bunch of infinities, making them x max, and scale is dividing by the maximum number. So the number outside the parenthesis is the total number of GM iterations, and the numbers in the parenthesis is the uh, number of iterative refinement steps. Okay, so you can see that like they take a large number of iterations, and few of them the GM uh, the iterative refinement doesn't even converge because the uh, it underflows and the matrix becomes singular in uh, singular in half precision so this is for the simple remedies and this is the result for diagonal scaling so zero implies that you don't need any iterative refinement at all so the whatever uh, initial guess you get from half precision lu factors are accurate up to single precision so we can discuss that uh, offline like why it happens so or in during the questions so we can see that it works well so a few remarks. So the purpose of diagonal scaling is to squeeze the matrix into half precision and not to reduce the condition number, but it does help us. It, it does help us indirectly by not making the pivots underflow. And the GM res IR with two-sided diagonal scaling, because we are scaling it back, is mathematically equivalent to doing but uh, to equivalent to solving an unscaled problem. And it is numerically equivalent if the scaling factors are uh, in the powers of two. Uh, but however, the, all this is true only if the pivot sequence does not change after diagonal scaling, but it does. It does. Okay. So again, like it's important to work with unscaled problems, so we go back even after doing diagonal scaling. So a few concluding remarks. So underflow and overflow issues are very crucial if you if we want to use half precision formats for general purpose scientific computing. So two-sided diagonal scaling works well uh, for simple uh, rather than simple remedies and few of them and all the remaining details of this work can be found in this preprint and questions thank you I wanted to make a comment that this is much closer to Wilkinson than you may realize. So 
<laughs> Wilkinson was very interested in uh, situations where you compute in single precision and then <laughs> do iterative refinement in double precision. So oh. the perspective has changed. You're now starting with double and trying to squeeze down. He was starting at single and trying to leverage up. Yeah. Um, but mathematically, the big change is that you're talking about GM res and preconditioners, yep. whereas he was in a much, much simpler concept of what an iteration meant. Yes. Thank you. I have a different comment about Wilkinson's early work. Yes. He did a lot with fixed point uh, yes. um, computation. In this context, that would be equivalent to working with integers with 16 bits. Oh. Yes. Has anyone thought of doing that? Do, do they work well on these machines? Um. I'm not quite sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> with these machine learning, people are looking at different kinds of hardware. A couple of weeks ago, there was a meeting at the Royal Society, and few people were interested in talking about the integer representation as well. But uh, I, I'm I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. I, just a tri personal question. Yes. Uh, using the FP, my, using my class. Yes. How long does it take to do a 300 by 300? Oh, okay. Interview? So the 13. Uh, so we have 13 matrices. And the average size is around 150. So it took uh, 12 hours for me to complete the experiment. Yes. Yes. Yeah, got, got awful slow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I had to leave it to run over a weekend. So. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I certainly never did a 300 by 300. Yeah. yeah. I think, well, I think that's a nice place to finish the morning. So let's uh, thanks for being uh, sweet old <laughs>